Welcome to our first Brain Fitness Forum. It's great to have you here. And our first speaker of the day is Dr. Michael Weiner. And he's been doing research for almost 50 years and is the principal investigator of the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging in Initiative, a 10-year study of over 1,500 subjects aimed at validate, validating biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease. He launched the brainhealthregistry.org, an internet-based registry with the goal of accelerating development of effective treatments for brain diseases. The registry recruits, screens, and monitors brain function on thousands of subjects. He has published over 800 articles and is the recipient of many awards for his research, including awards from the Veterans Administration, the Alzheimer's Association, and the American Academy of Neurology. We're really fortunate to have him here today. Thank you so much. Great seeing you all. So as you've heard, I've uh, been a doctor for more than 50 years. I've been doing research for a long time. I've been worked in the Alzheimer's field for 25 years. I have uh, several very large grants on Alzheimer's disease. So I know something about the cognitive aging and Alzheimer's disease, and I've given uh, lots of talks to scientific audiences and also to groups such as this. And what I've learned is uh, you've come here because you're interested in cognitive aging and Alzheimer's disease, you have questions, and it's just really best for me to answer your questions. So I actually have nothing prepared, I don't have any slides. Uh, I'm just gonna answer your questions and uh, uh, just start raising your hand and I'll answer your questions. Yes, ma'am, here, do you talk to the mic? Wow. Uh, my mother is 94 years old and she walks a couple miles a day. She lives in a retirement home in Texas. She was diagnosed with Alzheimer's two and a half years ago. And um, she's gotten a little worse, of course. She's gone downhill. But everyone says, oh, because she's 94, she doesn't have Alzheimer's. She just has dementia. So I. So uh, first of all, I'm sorry. But this is uh, my mother just passed away. She was 100, 101. She just passed away. She had Alzheimer's disease. She had dementia from Alzheimer's disease. And uh, this is, a, uh, is there anything, maybe you could talk to the uh, AV guys and they could raise the volume of the thing because I'm not used to, I'm not used to doing this, okay. It's, it's putting a, it's putting a, uh, putting a dent in my chin. Uh, so the, the, unfortunately, if you look at uh, the general population of people, let's say, who are over 85 or certainly over 90, the, uh, the incidence of dementia due to uh, generally dementia approaches 50% of the population. So for those of us who are going to live, and I'm sure I'm going to live past 100, at least my mother did, so, and I, I kind of look like her. So, uh, uh, you know, I've got, a, I've got a good chance of getting dementia, and of course, because I have a mom, uh, who had it, that increases my risk because I have a family history, which is probably a reason why many of you are here. It's probably in your family. How many of you have it in a blood relative? Yeah, well, so that's, that's the usual response I get from almost any audience. <clears throat> so you specifically were asking, what's the difference between dementia and uh, Alzheimer's disease? And so let me explain to you first what dementia is. Dementia is a term that we use in medicine to describe someone who is, has significant functional impairment, significant functional impairment mean, means that they're impaired in their ability to do day-to-day -day activities in a significant way due to cognitive impairment. That is, some people can't, some people are functionally impaired because they have a bad hip or they're functionally impaired because uh, they've had an injury to their shoulder. Uh, but that's not dementia. Dementia is when you have a functional impairment due to your inability to think properly. Uh, when we say cognitive impairment, we mean an impairment in thinking. Cognition is just a fancy word for thinking. And so dementia means that somebody has a significant functional impairment because they can't think well. Uh, that's, that's what dementia means. And furthermore, according to the a strict neurology definition of dementia, there has to be a significant impairment in two cognitive domains, two cognitive domains, 
Ooh, neurologists and people in the uh, neuroscience field tend to think of categorized thinking into different categories. Memory is one aspect of thinking. We all can associate with that. Problem solving is another aspect of thinking. Finding directions, figuring out where you are, trying to get from point A to point B, that's another form of thinking. A mathematical skill is another form of thinking. A musical skill is another form of thinking. Ability to speak language is another form of thinking. And what the neuroscientists have figured out over the years is that different parts of the brain are responsible for these different uh, types of thinking. And memory, the ability to learn something new and the ability to recall something that you have learned is uh, in very specific parts of the brain. And unfortunately, those are the parts of the brain that get targeted by Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease tends to hit the memory function. So just getting back to the definition of dementia, dementia means you've got significant functional impairment and it's due to an impairment of thinking and it's got to be two cognitive domains have to be impaired. Two cognitive domains have to be impaired, one of which has to be the memory domain. So in other words, strictly speaking, you can't have dementia according to the strict rules set up by the Academy of Neurology. You can't have dementia unless you have a memory problem. Although some people have major problems in thinking, they have good memory, but they, they seem to be very, very impaired. And you, know, you and I would tend to call these people demented, even though they have a good memory because their ability to speak or their ability to function in other ways is very, very impaired. So let's just talk about what that means. What does a significant functional impairment mean? Okay. All of us, as we're getting older, without exception, are finding that our brains are not functioning as well or certainly as fast as they used to. And memory function, without Jackson. question, gets, old, it gets worse as people get older. There's no 75-year-old who has the same memory functioning that they had when they were 30, okay? It's, just, it's just, just standard aging causes that. It's not Alzheimer's disease, it's just called aging. And it's certainly a slowing. Your ability to think quickly, to solve problems quickly, or to recall things quickly, especially names. Most of us, uh, me included, Oh, what is the name of that guy? Oh, yeah. What was the movie that I saw? <laughs> Can't remember. And then it comes to you after a while. So that's a very, very common thing. Okay. So, uh, but what is a significant functional impairment? A significant functional impairment in the medical sense means that there was an important thing that somebody could do before and they could no longer do it now. And uh, that doesn't necessarily mean somebody has completely lost independence. Has your mom able to function on her own? She, she doesn't need care. She's still functioning on her own. So she said she was diagnosed with dementia. So what is her biggest, what is her biggest problem? Um, memory. Um, but how does that affect her day-to-day -day life? Uh, what she can't. Remember when I'm coming to visit her, although I call her every day and tell her I'll be there on the 13th. And she said, Are you still in Paris? And I said, No, no, I'm, I'm back. I'm back. And, and I called her every day and said, No, she lives in an assisted living in a military retirement community, and it's very nice. And she has people, but she's very happy because she has neighbors and she can't remember their names, right. but, but she, she remembers a, my right. name. But she, she, now you can hold on to that mic because the next person who asks, the next person who asks, oh, maybe the, got to keep the mic like this, right? Okay. So she, if she were all of a sudden put in an apartment completely or on her own, she would not be able to function on her own. So she has lost a lot of functionality and it's due to her primarily in her inability to remember things. That's her biggest problem. Maybe she gets confused a little bit. Uh, and she what? She loses things. Well, that's a kind of a memory thing. She forgets where she put them. So, so okay, now, <clears throat> dementia is a symptom. What we're describing here is somebody who has a symptom. Alzheimer's disease is a specific disease that causes the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. 
that causes the symptoms of dementia. Alzheimer's disease is a specific disease that causes the symptoms of dementia. Just like chest pain is a symptom, heart attack is one disease that causes the symptom of chest pain, but other diseases cause chest pain. Pneumonia causes chest pain, a clot to the lung causes chest pain, a broken rib can cause chest pain, a bad, uh, you know, I ate too many tamales last night, that can uh, cause chest pain. So uh, chest pain is a symptom, a heart attack is the disease that causes that symptom. Dementia is a symptom, and dementia can be caused by many diseases. For example, stroke can produce dementia, or cerebral vascular disease, a situation in which the blood vessels to the brain don't give enough blood to the brain, that can produce dementia. There's something called Lewy body dementia. Lewy bodies uh, are associated with a protein called synuclein, which causes Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is associated with dementia in some cases due to the production of these so-called Lewy bodies. That's a different disease than Alzheimer's disease. They both produce dementia. So dementia can be due to many causes. And especially as people get older and older, as people get into their 90s or over 100, often when people have dementia, even though they're diagnosed as Alzheimer's disease, the pathology will show that they have other problems. They have what we call a mixed picture. They would have Alzheimer's disease. They may have some little strokes. They may have a little bit of alpha-synuclein. They may have other proteins. So, uh, so that's so here. So give her the mic. So she has another question. In your estimation, how far are we from a cure? Well, a cure, a, a cure, 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 a cure, a cure, a cure is a long way off. A cure means that somebody who's got it is is going to be brought back to where they were before they got it. Okay, that's what a cure implies. A cure is a long way off. What we're trying to do now, so for in the field of Alzheimer's disease, there are a number of drugs that are available, approved by the Food and Drug Administration, that can be prescribed, that have been shown to produce some benefit. But the benefit is small. And they do not slow the progression. They just give, they just make the person a little, function a little better, or think a little more clearly. But they do not slow the rate of progression. So once you get Alzheimer's disease, once people get Alzheimer's disease, it's a pretty progressive disorder, which gets worse and worse over time, and the dementia gets worse, and they need more and more care, and ultimately it can, uh, the Alzheimer's disease itself can ultimately be fatal because the person can no longer feed themselves. They need to be fed, and they're in pretty bad shape. So what we're looking for now are treatments that slow the rate of progression, and we're also looking for treatments that could be given early. So for, and I'll talk about this more, some of us in this room have early Alzheimer's disease. We don't know it, but we have the disease processes going on in our brain. Uh, probably 25% of the people in this room have early Alzheimer's disease going on in their brain. And, or maybe not that high, maybe 10%, but, <laughs> Well, let me put it this way: If you're over, if you're if average if people, average age in in the big study that I'm doing, uh, people of my age, people in their middle seventies, one third of them have early people who are completely normal, people who are completely normal, completely healthy, feel fine. One third of them have early, they have Alzheimer's plaques, amyloid plaques in their brain, they have early Alzheimer's disease. So what we would like to do, and there are studies now ongoing, and there are some of these studies going on here in San Francisco, that the, what we wanna do is we wanna identify people at risk and get them into a treatment trial to try to prevent the decline. So the, the idea is to catch the disease early before it produces symptoms and either slow it or stop it. Now that's not a, exactly what most people would call a cure, but it would be pretty damn good if we could prevent the development of cognitive impairment and dementia in people by starting them on treatment early, that would be something close to a cure, okay? Now, I, I'm just focusing on people at this end of the room. If I just stand here, why don't we, why don't we give the other, the other side of the room a chance, okay? 
Is there a special diet that we can start following to, to delay the onset? No, sorry. I wish. If it were, I would be on it. But uh, this is going to lead to the, the usual questions I get here is, what can I do to uh, prevent myself from having cognitive decline and dementia? That's what you're all hoping I'm going to come here and tell you. That there's something really, uh, this has got great, great thing. Because there are all these claims being made. There are many, many claims being made. And you'll see articles all the time in magazines and newspapers and this and that. You do this, you do that. And the best thing you can do is choose the right parents. <laughs> okay. Alzheimer's disease is really genetic. So uh, you should have thought of that, you know, earlier. Uh, you should have uh, chosen the right parent. So it's, seriously, it's very genetic. So if you have one, uh, if you have one parent who has had Alzheimer's, and not just dementia, but they had to have Alzheimer's, and most dementia is Alzheimer's, uh, then your risk goes up. And then if you've had two parents, then your risk goes up more. And if you have a lot of people in your family, then your risk goes up more. But just because you're at high risk doesn't mean you're going to get it. Uh, some people with high risk don't. There are some people with a lot of risk factors and a lot of genes for Alzheimer's disease who live to over 100 and they never have any symptoms. We don't, we don't completely understand why that is. But there, and there's research on that. So the main thing you can do after you've got your genes, that is after you're born, is live healthy. That is, you know, if you have your blood pressure checked, make sure your blood pressure is well controlled for sure. That's smoking, cigarettes, and, and the other kind of stuff, you know, that's becoming legal in California. That's probably not so bad. But, but tobacco, tobacco is not good. Uh, extremely heavy drinking is probably not that good. A low moderate drinking is, may even be a benefit or may not be a benefit. Uh, <clears throat> there, is, uh, there is some evidence that uh, regular exercise is helpful. It certainly makes you feel good. And exercise definitely improves cognition. So if you take a group of people, if you took a group of people in this room who didn't exercise very much, and you did some testing of their cognition, and then you had them go on the treadmill every day for half an hour and build up a sweat and work out, and do that for a month or two, their, their uh, cognitive function, their ability to remember things would be improved as a group. So exercise definitely improves your cognition. Uh, it improves your mood. There's a lot of benefits from exercise. I happen to be a big exerciser, but my mom made it to 101. She did develop Alzheimer's disease when she was 95. She, 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 she didn't have any other problem, really, and, then, and she never exercised at all. So, and that's not so uncommon because it is so genetic. But you can do bad things to yourself, okay? I mean, you have to avoid doing the bad things. I, I think that eating a lot, of, uh, a lot of hard fats, a lot of you know, bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwiches, and a lot of pork all the time, probably not so good. There is some data, there is some data that uh, fish oil is good. Uh, people who have high uh, levels of fish oil in their blood seem to do better than people with low levels of, of uh, you know, the uh, DHA compounds are associated with fish oil. The people who eat a lot of fish, like in Norway and so forth, eat a lot of sardines and salmon and all that, they seem as a group to do better. But it's, um, we're not at the point where that's really been nailed down and proven. Uh, there are some studies which have been done in the last couple of years in which they've done, you could say, they've taken the multi-domain approach. They've done exercise, they've done fish oil, they've done uh, cognitive stimulation, various types of things to stimulate your brain. They put it all together and that appears to slow the rate of cognitive decline in these people. Uh, these studies probably need replication, and uh, we're not at the point. I mean, but these are all good things. The, the practical question is, and my, maybe I'm wrong here, but some people in this, some people here in this room are just, they like to exercise. They get up every day, they make sure they, they go to your gym or you go out walking, and other people don't. And to tell somebody, well, you know, you ought to do a lot of more exercise because it's going to prevent you from getting Alzheimer's disease in 15 years. I don't, I don't really don't think that works. So I don't think that people do it. So it's a question of what is practical. But I don't think of, 
I don't know. There's there's claims for blueberries and antioxidants. There's all these claims, and I, I I'm just not that impressed. So where is the mic? Who's got the mic? Okay. I have uh, two questions. Yeah. One is, uh, recently I saw a program where they did and put music to people with dementia on, and they came alive and started communicating. Uh, has that been proven to helpful or just? I don't know anything about it. Okay. I'm sorry. I don't know anything about it. But, you know, the problem is that there are, there's lots of projects getting funded. They're good projects. Some people get some results. And, uh, you know, and then it gets into the newspapers, and it looks like it's a breakthrough. But how many breakthroughs have we read about in the papers and the magazines over 30 years that you never hear about again? So the whole key in science is what you call replication and generalizability. So some studies are done on a very small sample of patients, you know, a very select group of people. They're done once. And they get a result, the result looks good. But then when, they, when somebody else tries to do it, they can't replicate it. And then the question is, does it really work on large numbers of people? So Also, um, what about these, uh, if you exercise your brains with uh, crossword puzzles, learning a language, is that proven to be of any help? You know, I think that there's pretty good data that doing that does certainly improve your ability to perform certain cognitive tests. So if I give you a test, I'm going to give you a test right now, okay? I'm going to ask you to remember, this is the classic type of test. I'm going to mention a couple of words, and then I'm going to ask you all to remember the words, okay? So I'll just, here, here, here we go. Car, moon, pencil, banana, earth, uh, flower, truck, cabin, building, grass, okay? Now, if I ask you, how many of those words can you remember, okay? You can remember some, okay? So that's a test of your ability to remember things. And then if I came back five minutes later and said, well, now tell me what I remember those words, how, how many of those can you remember? So these are called memory tests. Another kind of memory test is I'll give you a bunch of numbers. Two, nine, six, four, three, eight, five, six, seven. Okay, now give me those numbers backwards. Okay, that's that's another it's a memory test. Okay, well we can we get start easy. Make it give you two, three, six. Okay, two, three, six. Now remember that. Can you remember? Can you give me that backwards? Okay, yeah. Hopefully you can. So so what I'm saying is these are tests of memory, and there are all kinds of tests like that. Uh, that are used to uh, judge your ability to learn things and to remember things. And there, are, there is evidence that numerous things, uh, for example, exercise, as I mentioned, and uh, some of these brain training uh, things, there's all different types of brain training programs. Those things can improve your ability to perform well on tests, okay? But the important thing is, does it really improve your function? That is, your day-to-day -day function. And more importantly, does it really prevent the decline that occurs when you have a disease like Alzheimer's disease? And uh, the, these, uh, most of, to my knowledge, I'm not a completely an expert in this, but to my knowledge, most of these things, they can improve your ability to perform on tests. They may improve functionality in some small groups. The, the data that they can actually slow cognitive decline is, is not, not strong and has not been replicated. It certainly is not at the point where the, um, the American Academy of Neurology or the American Medical Association is recommending to the public that they do things, do these things. We haven't gotten to that level. So I'm not saying that they're not worth anything, and maybe for some people, some things work, okay? We need to do a lot of research in this area. But we do know that Alzheimer's disease is caused by the accumulation of two proteins. One protein is called amyloid. The other protein is called tau. The amyloid forms into little plaques, little... Uh, little clumps in the brain outside of nerve cells. The tau forms tangles inside of nerve cells and damages the parts of the brain that are involved with memory. And as the tau spreads throughout the brain and gets into more and more nerve cells, the memory function gets worse and people have cognitive decline and dementia. That we know. Most 
research is aimed at trying to get out the amyloid and trying to get out the tau. Currently, people are using antibodies to do that. Antibodies against amyloid and antibodies against tau. And the pharmaceutical industry is investing some billions of dollars right now trying to develop treatments to pull out the amyloid and pull out the tau because we believe that the progression of the tau that is that has been supported by the amyloid is what is killing the nerve cells. That's not to say that exercise, mind games, other things may not have a role, but uh, the, the majority of the scientific community is really focused on the specific disease, which is amyloid accumulation, tau accumulation, and then the tau seems to damage neurons and cause memory uh, problems and dementia. So, another question. Along the same lines, how is the diagnostic made? How do you know that a person has Alzheimer or not? So, it's a very good question. How do you know that somebody has Alzheimer's disease? The, the question was, how do you know that somebody has Alzheimer's disease? So, in the past, uh, in the recent, up until maybe 10 years ago, uh, People, when they were alive, we would try to make a diagnosis. You'd first make a diagnosis of dementia. That is, does the person have a severe functional impairment due to a problem with thinking? And then the doctor would try to figure out, well, what is the cause of this dementia? And, uh, for example, hypothyroidism can produce something that really looks like a dementia. So if somebody is beginning to slip, they're losing their memory function, that looks like they're getting dementia, you definitely want to do a thyroid test. You definitely want to do a thyroid test. Reminds me of a horrible story that I was involved with as a young uh, a professor in which we had a man who was a doctor who had been in practice with his partner it, in Wisconsin for 60 years. They had married twin sisters. It's, they both served in World War I. They were working up in northern Wisconsin. And one of them began to show signs of dementia and declined and had to be taken care of. And his partner brought him finally to our hospital with instructions that we shouldn't do any workup. We shouldn't examine this guy. We should just basically bring him into the hospital and let him die. He said, I don't want the medical students to be examining him and I don't want any tests. I just want him to be able to die in peace in the hospital. And, uh, so I, you know, I, at that point, I think I was 31 years old, and uh, uh, I said, okay, you know, that's, that sounds reasonable. So, uh, so a couple of days later, this man passed away, and then a couple of days later, I get a page to the morgue, to, and the pathologist, so they allowed this person to have an autopsy. And the, we go down to see the pathologist, and the pathologist says, Mike, I have really bad news for you. This man died of hypothyroidism. If he had just gotten a thyroid treatment, he could, this whole thing could have been corrected, okay? And uh, I just still feel terrible about that. And of course, I'll never listen to uh, another uh, instruction about not working somebody up uh, uh, again. And hypothyroidism can produce a, a dementia syndrome. And there are some other conditions that can produce a dementia syndrome. But most dementia is really caused by Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's or other kinds of diseases. So anyway, in the past, the diagnosis was made based on clinical grounds, meaning you interview the patient, you interview the family, you uh, might do a, a CAT scan to make sure there's not a brain tumor or a big stroke causing the dementia. And then uh, the, you'd make the diagnosis, and only if the person had an autopsy could you know for sure that the person had Alzheimer's. And I see a number of you are nodding your heads. You've heard that before. You only know that you have Alzheimer's disease if you have an autopsy. But then about 10 years ago, this began to change because of some brilliant scientists, especially a guy named Chet Mathis at the University of Pittsburgh, who came up with a PET scan dye for amyloid called PIB, Pittsburgh Compound B, PIB, P-I-B. And uh, this was revolutionary. And we, we, I have a very large NIH grant on Alzheimer's, and we incorporated this into our grant. And then the companies got into it, and there was a company named Avid Pharmaceuticals that was formed. Uh, they came out with something called Florbetapir, 
And then another company came out with flumetamol. So there's a number of PET scan compounds that stick to amyloid. And basically, they can determine whether or not you have a lot of plaques full of amyloid in your brain in a living person. So now we have the ability to determine whether somebody has Alzheimer's disease when they're alive. And the results of this technique, so this is now being widely used in research settings. It's not being used in clinical settings, and I'll, and I'll get to that in a minute. But what we've learned from this is that, first of all, about 85% of people who are diagnosed clinically with dementia due to Alzheimer's disease, that is the doctor examine them, talk to the family, and the doctor thinks they have dementia due to Alzheimer's disease. About 85% of those people really do have Alzheimer's disease. But 15% don't. That is, it's a false positive diagnosis. They're misdiagnosed. They have it, they have something else causing the dementia, but it's not Alzheimer's. 15%. Now, what's really interesting is that if you don't have something called the ApoE4 gene, there's a specific gene called ApoE4, which is pretty common in the population. One-fifth of the people in this room have the ApoE4 gene, 20%. Okay, so, you know, a whole chunk of us have that ApoE4 gene. And if you have the ApoE4 gene, you're two to three times or maybe even four times as likely to get dementia due to Alzheimer's disease if you don't have the ApoE4 gene. So if you have a parent who's had Alzheimer's disease, it's possible that you have that ApoE4 gene from the parent, or you might have the ApoE4 gene even though you're, you don't have a parent. So if you, have the Apo, if you don't have the ApoE4 gene, if you don't have the ApoE4 gene, and you have dementia, which looks like Alzheimer's disease, only 60% of those people have it due to Alzheimer's. 40% of people who lack the ApoE4 gene seem to have dementia from some other cause. So that's for people who have dementia. I hope I'm not losing you here. That's for people that have dementia. Now, the other thing that came out from my study and many other studies is that if you're a completely normal person in your 70s or 80s, uh, the quite a high uh, incidence of Alzheimer's pathology, that is, uh, if you have plaques. As I said, about 30%, 25 or 30% of the people in their middle 70s have a brain full of amyloid. So they have early Alzheimer's disease. They're completely asymptomatic, but they have early Alzheimer's disease. Just like some women are walking around and they have a little breast cancer. They don't feel it. They don't feel a lump. They don't know they have it. But they have an early form of cancer, and it can be detected by a uh, mammogram, and then hopefully it can be biopsied and removed. So there are many, many, many diseases that begin small and then get bigger. We call it the preclinical stage. Preclinical means the disease exists, but the person doesn't have any symptoms from the disease. Perfect example is coronary artery disease. Lots of people walk around with plaques in their coronary arteries of their heart. They've got hardening of their arteries. Their arteries are getting more and more narrow. They're, they seem to be fine. They have no symptoms at all, but then one day they may run for a bus or something else happens and then they have a heart attack. So they had a preclinical coronary artery disease that wasn't clinically manifest until maybe a clot developed in that coronary artery or they ran for a bus or something like that. So we're, we all can understand that there's a preclinical phase, just like HIV AIDS. People can have HIV and they don't have any symptoms of AIDS. They just have the HIV, but they have the, they have the preclinical HIV AIDS. So almost all diseases start small, get bigger and bigger, 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 and then all of a sudden a person gets sick. Whoa, whoa, what happened? I was fine yesterday, but in fact that disease was building up all those years before. That's exactly what goes on in Alzheimer's. So the be beauty of these PET scans is that you can detect it early, and that's the big hope for the future. The big hope for the future is that we can find a way first to identify people who are at high risk and secondly once we know that somebody's at risk we can do what we call a prevention trial to prevent them from getting the symptoms after all this is what we do in clinical medicine all the time we try to treat high blood pressure 
Be not because of the high, we don't like high blood pressure. It's because we know that if you walk around with untreated hypertension for 20 or 30 years, you're at much higher risk to have a stroke or a heart attack. So we prevent heart attacks and stroke by treating hypertension, by doing blood pressure screening and by treating people with medications. Some 30 year old says, you tell somebody who's 30 and 40, you say, you know, you got hypertension, you got to take these pills. Oh, I feel fine. I don't need to take these pills. No, you got to take these pills because if you don't, your risk for getting a heart attack in 10 or 20 years is way up. So most of us get our blood pressure treated, even though we realize that we don't need, it's not for today, it's for the future. The same thing with statins and cholesterol, I think you all know about hyper high cholesterol levels are associated with more cardiovascular disease the statins lower your cholesterol they don't you don't you don't have, you don't have a symptom from a high cholesterol but a high cholesterol increases your risk to develop cardiovascular disease so we use treatments for hypertension we use treatments for high cholesterol to lower the risk okay but we identify people at risk we don't treat everybody with with antihypertensives we don't treat everybody with statins. We just treat people who have high cholesterol or high blood pressure. So that's what we're trying, that, this is the way we're thinking in the Alzheimer's field. We want to identify what are the risk factors? How do we know who's gonna have a problem? And then we do a treatment trial, a prevention trial on those people uh, to see whether we can prevent cognitive decline, development of mild cognitive impairment, which is like a prelude to developing dementia. And that's why I've started this project called, uh, here's a pitch now, this is the commercial. The Brain Health Registry, this is my website, brainhealthregistry.org. The Brain Health Registry is an internet re registry where people like you can sign up and come and, and answer questions and take some tests and keep coming back. We have no, more than 50,000 people have joined the Brain Health Registry now. The idea is to track people thousands of people over the long term and try to figure out how we determine who's at risk. And ultimately what we want to do is guide people who are in the registry to, to enter into prevention trials because the big future here is in prevention, finding ways to prevent. Now maybe diet, exercise, cognitive stimulation, um, all kinds of gadgets that people have, maybe other ways of preventing Alzheimer's disease will be shown. I mean, it's, the, the investment in this area is huge, 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 huge. Lots of people are putting a lot of money into it. There's some good ideas out there. This is a tough disease to, to, to find effective treatments for. So let's, so who's got the mic? The mic is over there, I'm sorry. And you're gonna, somebody's gonna tell me when we have to stop and, and let the, give everybody a break. Go ahead. My question is, Alzheimer's disease is a hereditary disease. Yeah, it's not a hereditary disease. Is it a hereditary disease? Alzheimer's disease is a very hereditary disease. A very, very strongly hereditary disease. Absolutely. Now, the problem is that because it's a disease of the elderly, uh, many of us did not have parents and grandparents who lived long enough to get it, you see. So if all your parents and grandparents died, let's say in their 70s from cancer or heart disease, accidents or other things, you might have the gene or the genes for Alzheimer's disease, but you didn't see it because your parents didn't live long enough to get it. My mom made it to 101, so I know that, that uh, but I don't, I don't think I have the ApoE4 gene. Oh, I should just mention though, there, I mentioned this ApoE4 gene, and it is possible to be tested for the ApoE4 gene but it's not considered standard of care to test people for the ApoE4 gene for reasons which I don't completely agree with. But anyway, the Neurology Association has not recommended testing for the gene because it's a risk factor and because there's nothing you can do about it, okay? That's the big thing. The same thing with this amyloid scan, these PET scans. You see, these PET scans could tell you whether or not you have early Alzheimer's disease, or if you have some symptoms, it could tell you whether or not your symptoms are due to Al Alzheimer's disease. But at the current time, the Center for Medicare Services, or CMS, in other words, Medicare, will not pay for these scans. They've refused to pay for the scans, and it makes sense that they've refused to pay for the scans, I'm sorry to say. The scans are very expensive, many, many thousands of dollars, and they're, what can you do? Well, there is really no effective treatment to slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease. 
So should we be spending billions of dollars, because that's what it would be, we could end up spending billions of dollars to do a lot of PET scans on people for what? So, uh, but everybody knows that as soon as we have a treatment that works, and there are some trials going on right now that are encouraging, there, there definitely are some trials going on right now that really look encouraging, but we won't know until the trials are over, and that will be at least one or two years from now. Uh, so one, you know, in the next couple of years, you may wake up one day and see in the news and see in the newspaper, breakthrough treatment for Alzheimer's disease. It's, we finally got something that really has a big effect done on thousands of people. And uh, these studies cost, you know, $200 million to do per study. For a company to develop a drug for Alzheimer's disease, one drug, it's well over a billion dollars. Well over a billion dollars for one drug. So every time you look at these little pills that you get from CVS or Walgreens, and you wonder, why is this little pill costing so much? Does it really cost so much to make that pill? The answer is you're not just paying for the pill. You're paying for all the research that didn't work because the companies have to recoup their, their investment. So you're paying not just for the pills that work. You're paying for all the stuff that failed, and most studies fail. Okay. So how many? Uh, okay. Unfortunately, I think we just have time for one more question. I come from a family that is very much at risk. For Alzheimer's, my mother was one of 11 children, and of the 11, eight of them developed it. Now, of course, at that How old were they? Uh, from in, in their 70s, my mom oh, okay. was, okay. okay. And uh, my brother has it. He was just diagnosed, he's 85 now. He was diagnosed a couple of years back. And Well, um, you seem to be in pretty good shape to me. Well, I'm just thinking that I'd probably be a, an ideal person to be in some kind of a study because... Well, there are lots of studies going on, and I'm and doing several, and there's lots at UCSF and CPMC. Right. And, I mean, yeah. the one thing I can leave you all with is if you really want to see something done with Alzheimer's disease, give money. You can give it to the Alzheimer's Association if you want. You can give it to for my research, but I, I'm not really uh, pitching for my own work. The Alzheimer's Association is a great organization. And there are lots of research going on here in San Francisco. It's one of the big centers. But you, you had a question. No, I was going to say, if I were taken into some kind of a program, um, I'm, I'm afraid that sometimes when you're doing studies, you have like a, a control group that are got, getting a placebo instead of the, the possible helpful medication. And exactly. And I hate to think that I'm going to be, I don't know. You don't know you if don't you're going to be that. Right, that's true. And, and that's taking a chance that... Well, that's true, but you don't want to... Right, but that's the way you want it to be because you don't want somebody to treat you with something if they don't know it works, okay? But let me just say, I'm the principal, I'm the director of a big project called the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, or ADNI, A-D-N-I. It's the biggest study across the United States of Alzheimer's, which involves no treatment. It's purely what we call observational. We're just trying to learn about Alzheimer's disease and do better trials. And uh, Bruce, uh, Dr. Rosen, Howard Rosen at UCSF runs the local ADNI clinic. And I'm a patient in the study. I have all the scans, the, the lumbar punctures, the blood tests. I take all these tests. I've been participating in the study for 10 years. It's actually kind of interesting to, to be in these studies. You, you see the way medical research works and you're making a contribution because we can't develop improved treatments. We can't make medicine better unless we have people who are willing to volunteer to participate in the trials. It's just that simple. So it's something we all can do, and, you know, it's a way of contributing. So I want to thank you for being here on this beautiful Sunday, and uh, you had so many questions. Maybe they'll invite me back, okay? Have a good day.